uh, nodding their heads. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Sarah Persley, who's an assistant professor in the Middle East and Islamic Studies Department here at NYU. Uh, her book, which we're here to celebrate, Familiar Futures, is, is called Familiar Futures, Time, Selfhood, and Sovereignty in Iraq from 1920 to 1963, which was released just last month from Stanford University Press. Uh, Sarah's work looks at uh, how various understandings of time and selfhood, both secular and Islamic, shaped pedagogical interventions into the intimate lives of Iraqis in the name of economic development and or anti-colonial revolution. Uh, before coming to NYU in 2016, Sarah taught courses in, on the modern Middle East for seven years at Princeton University, the CUNY Graduate Center, where she received her PhD, uh, and Queens College. Um, that's the short version of the introduction, but I, I'm sure so many of you are very familiar and very eager to, to hear her speak tonight. I, we're also very, very lucky to have Sinan Antoun with us tonight. Sinan Antoun uh, is an associate professor at the Gallatin School. Uh, he, his teaching and research interests lie in the pre-modern and modern Arabic literature and contemporary Arab culture and politics. His scholarly works include The Poetics of the Obscene, uh, Ibn al-Hajjaj, and Souf from Paul Gray Macmillan in 2014, and numerous essays on the poetry of Muhammad. Arish, Sarva Bulus, and, and on contemporary Iraqi culture. His essays and creative writings in Arabic have appeared in major journals and publications in the Arab world and on the Al Jazeera.net, New York Times, The Nation, Middle East Report, Journal of Palestine Studies, Journal of Arabic Literature, Massachusetts Review, World Literature Today, Plowshares, and the Washington Square Journal. So we are very, very lucky to have uh, these two folks here tonight. And without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off uh, to Sarah. And uh, please join me in welcoming them both. for uh, especially Jim and uh, Fidel for organizing um, this event and uh, all of you for coming. I'm really honored with the, the turnout and uh, grateful to be able to uh, reflect um, a little on the book um, at this moment. It's been a long time in the making. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to uh, talk a little about that, about sort of the, the making of the book and how I um, got to um, the themes of the book. Um, sort of from the district, this came out of my dissertation at the CUNY uh, Graduate Center. Um, and. I thought there'd be a large proportion of grad students in the audience, so I thought I'd say a little bit about how I got from the perspectives of the dissertation to the, um, to the book, uh, because things did change fairly uh, radically along the way, um, but there is a kind of logic um, underneath it all, I think. Um, and uh, I'm just going to wing it, uh, basically, because I knew this was an informal uh, setup, and I didn't want to just have a talk, um, read a talk to you. Uh, so this, this project started, um, um, actually, what well, my dissertation perspectives was, was uh, was on a family uh, law um, in Iraq um, that was passed in 1959 after the Iraqi Revolution of 1958. So I really wanted to think about this revolutionary era in Iraq from the Revolution of 58, which was an anti-colonial revolution that overthrew the British-backed and British-created um, um, Iraqi uh, Hashemite monarchy, 1958, uh, from that moment up to 1963, which is often called the, the uh, revolutionary era in Iraq. It ends in 1963 with the first uh, Ba'ath coup. So this is the beginning of sort of the Ba'athist uh, rise to power in Iraq. Um, I wanted to think about this revolutionary era in the context of this family law because it became one of the major conflicts um, in this uh, very conflictual period. You know, there was a lot going on. Um, and yet this family law that was passed in 1959 became one of the major conflicts. And it had just become uh, sort of habitual for historians to list this family law as one of three or four factors behind the rise of the Ba'ath, behind the success of the first Ba'ath coup of 1963. Um, because what the Ba'ath was able to do in that moment was to kind of create a coalition. You know, they were a secular Arab nationalist party, but they were able to create a coalition um, between themselves and other Arab nationalists and um, both Sunni and Shia uh, religious authorities um, in opposition to the personal status law. So that was, you know, just one um, factor in the coming together of this coalition that ensured the success um, of the 1963 coup, which then resulted in a slaughter of communists and other um, leftists um, in Iraq. Um, and even though, you know, so that's pretty, that's pretty significant, right? Historians are saying it's pretty significant. It's one factor in the rise of the Ba'ath. Um, but, but very few people would actually, you know, you read these history books and there's hardly ever more than a sentence um, on the actual conflict over the law and, you know, what it was about. And I think the reason for that is, um, we assume we already know the story, right? On one side is uh, women's rights and modernization and sexual equality. On the other side is 
religious tradition and patriarchy and uh, you know reactionary uh, forces. We already know the story, so we don't need to tell it again, right? I think that was um, the, the, the explanation for this kind of um, uh, dichotomy um, in, the, in, the, in the historical literature. When I actually got um, into the archives then, I, I really changed the project. I mean, the personal status law is still in here, the Family Law of 1959, it's um, chapter seven. Um, but I really broadened the topic and I got interested in these themes of time, self and sovereignty, um, and um, also economic uh, development. Because one of the things that happened when I actually got into the archives and started reading, I was coming out of this um, a tradition uh, of gender and family reform scholarship, what I'd been reading in grad school, my advisor uh, was Beth Barron, um, that focused really um, exclusively on the late 19th century uh, through the interwar um, period. And I think, I was thinking about this today, I think it didn't even occur to me um, until I got into the archives that I was looking at a different time period. <laughs> like I was looking at the <laughs> 1950s and you know none of the scholarship was about the 1950s. And so my uh, proposed arguments actually just weren't even relevant really to, to the, the, the archival material I was reading. Um, so I had to change my arguments um, and sort of rethink um, this period of time, uh, as well as um, some aspects of gender and family reform um, in the region. I mean, right now off the top of my head, I can think of one book now in the 50s in, on the whole Middle East on, on gender reform, uh, Laura Beer's book, she was a PhD student here, um, but this uh, didn't exist when I was uh, working on it. There's just not that much uh, in general in the Middle East for the 1950s. Um, and one of the big differences uh, in this time period was I learned, you know, when I was reading about uh, the conflict over this law was that Everybody, on all sides of the conflict, and there were more than two sides, everybody was making their arguments in the name of economic development. This was just the, um, the frame, the idiom that people made arguments in, you know, not just in Iraq, but in the, um, all of the decolonizing countries, which had just recently started to be called developing countries. Right? 1945 is when the world was divided into developed and developing countries. After 1945, you were uh, one or the other. I told Jim I would need uh, two, gla uh, two glasses of water. <laughs> It's right when I'm nervous. <laughs> um, so, uh, so economic development was a frame in which everyone's arguments were being made, and, and um, pretty much everyone in this conflict agreed that family life was a pu was of public interest, and that the goal of being publicly interested in family life and intimate life was to create subjects, Iraqi subjects, who would ensure the nation's future economic development. So everybody on all sides of the conflict were making that argument, and whatever you know, uh, uh, thing they were arguing for was the thing best suited um, for that future, for that future um, economic development. And this was not just, you know, when I say the 50s was different from the 20s and 30s, it, it was not just that the word progress became the word development, which is how people often understand it. Um, there were really significant differences, and, and one of the biggest differences for these uh, questions of gender and family reform was that this wasn't, um, like a middle class nationalist movement promoting bourgeois feminine domesticity, right? Which is a big focus in the interwar period for good reason. Um, these projects were targeting uh, lower class women, lower class families, you know, laboring uh, families, both rural and urban. You know, this was the focus uh, because the focus was to create um, economic development. And another thing I'll just say about that um, is some of you might be wondering um, what I mean by economic development um, because, of course, the term can mean different things. Uh, but it didn't really mean that many different things in this um, time period in Iraq. Um, it meant capitalist economic development, and even the Iraqi Communist Party, which was the largest and most popular party um, in Iraq at the time, that's what it meant for them as well, because this was the bourgeois capitalist phase of the two-stage revolution leading to socialism, right? So we had to have capitalism um, now. So this, this is what it meant, and then of course it also included all kinds of social ideas of social reform and social uh, justice, um, but I think it was more focused on social reform for producing these kinds of subjects who could increase um, productivity. Um, so this, you know, um, this got me interested in economic development. I wanted to go back in time and think more about the history of economic development um, in Iraq. And I also, around this time, got interested in questions of uh, temporality or time, uh, sort of the paradoxical um, aspects of modern um, conceptions and experiences of time. So, uh, for example, what, what interested me right away in this conflict was, one thing that interested me was, um, you know, what kind of things in this revolutionary era, what kind of things um, that people said they wanted got deferred to the future, right? And it usually ended up being this ever receiving future, um, if it was going to get deferred like that. And what kind of things actually became the focus of immediate change, right? So. Um, I'm really interested in sort of the paradoxes between uh, uh, mobility and immobility or stagnation and movement in these modernization and development um, projects. So in the revolutionary period, I mean one just brief way to summarize it is that um, 
pop ideas of popular sovereignty, of democracy, of representative government, which all of the parties said they wanted, and I think at least some of them were perfectly genuine about it, but that's what got deferred, right? We can't have any of that until we have economic development. So it was pretty much a consensus um, about that. Um, and economic development meant we have to change Iraqi people, we have to change Iraqi subjects in order to make them capable of development. So you had this weird sort of paradox where parties who were critical of military rule, right, the revolution is technically a military coup, we call it a revolution for one because it had a lot of, uh, so much popular support. Um, all of the parties at least said they were against the continuation of military government, which was supposed to be transitional, um, and yet that uh, transition got perpetually deferred while all of the parties are also calling on the Iraqi state, encouraging the Iraqi state to intervene more and more into the intimate lives of Iraqi subjects through family law and, and a lot of other social reform um, laws and uh, projects. And one thing I point out um, in the introduction and then again in chapters six and seven, which are on the revolution, is that there were four political parties involved in the coalition that came together in 1957 and uh, was behind uh, you know, supporting the, uh, the revolution. Of those four political parties, none of them uh, ever achieved what they declared was their main um, historical goal in Iraq. Um, so for the Communist Party, it was a socialist society, right? For the National Democratic Party, it was a liberal democracy. For the Ba'ath and the Independence Parties, it was Arab Union, right? Those were the two Arab nationalist parties. None of them ever achieved that, not just in the revolutionary period, but ever in Iraq, right? So, so what all of them declared as their main historical goal got perpetually deferred. And I think this, um, these concepts of the primacy of economic development is uh, one, one factor um, in that, and sort of the, yeah, the, the consensus and agreement on that. Um, another thing that happened um, in the archives, I actually should have been finding myself. Mm -hmm. Can I get a five minute warning from Jim? Mm -hmm. So about 15, 20 minutes, right? Yeah. Five minutes now? Five minutes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Perfect. Um, another thing I got interested in was um, I became much more interested in criticisms of this law than I thought I would. So the law had been um, promoted by the progressive forces in Iraq, right? The communists and the liberals, the leftists and the liberals. Um, so it was seen as sort of promoting women's equality, sexual equality, and, and it's very problematic in, in those ways, which I'm not going to go into now. But um, I became, uh, I was not expecting to be interested in the criticisms of the law, especially those coming from um, Shia uh, religious authorities were, were the ones I found the most interesting, and also some Shia lay people too. Um, and one, I'll just mention one, uh, um, the Shia cleric wrote a book in 1963 criticizing the personal status law, and one thing he argued was that the law only appears to promote progressive change, this, this state-centered law. One thing the law did is, it, I mean, the main thing it did is it removed Islamic law from family law from Islamic authorities and brought it under the control of the state, right? For the first time in Iraq's history. Um, he said it only appears to promote progressive change. It actually replaces the um, temporally and spatially dynamic um, Islamic systems of jurisprudence with legal stasis. Um, and this is true, um, I mean, if you extend his argument to the, to the nation state law in general, you know, he said it's now a single law for a defined territory um, and it's what he said is it requires every judge in every generation to pass, um, you know, uh, to rule according to its precepts. Whereas in Islamic law, he argued, was both spatially and temporally dynamic. He's talking about Shia, um, Shia legal practices in particular. Um, he argued that the, the law closes the gates of ishtihad, which is independent juristic reasoning, which is interesting because modernizing reformers, when they, when they want to criticize Islamic law, they often say that the gates of ishtihad were closed centuries ago in Islam, and that's when everything started to stagnate, right? We need to open the gates of ishtihad. And so what he is saying is this, it's this nation state law that closes the gates of ishtihad and freezes um, law in place. And also closes the gates of uh, taqlid, which is a Shia legal practice that allows, basically allows um, the Shia followers to choose who their religious authorities are in any moment. So he says, you know, um, uh, religious leaders are not appointed over a given territory and for a specified period of time. They're chosen anew by their followers at every moment in time. And that's what allows the law to change. That's what allows Islamic law to keep changing and gives it its dynamic um, quality. So I was, I was already thinking about time and temporality and sort of the ways in which the modern nation state freezes certain kinds of things in place. So I found that a very interesting argument and I elaborate on that in the book. Um, and, and that helped me to think about sort of the, the way the nation state freezes things in place in the same way that um, the modern family that was implemented by this law freezes things in place because the law was completely oriented towards making marriages more permanent, uh, making divorce more difficult, um, uh, not recognizing muta marriage or, or temporary marriage, which is the Shia practice of marriage. Um, it's a marriage contracted for a specified period of time, which should be one hour or 99 years, and the point of it is sexual pleasure. That's the reason you contract it. Um, children born are legitimate, but you can't contract it for that purpose. Obviously, this has no place in the sort of modern um, concept of a family um, that is oriented 
towards certain kinds of stability and again towards um, economic development. Um, so this is what happened. This is why I rethought the book, um, the dissertation, and then the book around these concepts of um, time, selfhood, and sovereignty. And I didn't get to all those concepts, but I could say more about um, some of them in the Q and A. Um, yeah, I was also going to say a little about the title, Familiar Futures, and sort of the four sets of meanings that I, uh, or registers, I call them in the introduction, I have uh, in mind for that, but I'll just throw that out there now in case anyone's curious. You can't <laughs> see it. Um, so I'll stop there. So, can everyone hear me? Okay, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and to uh, celebrate this book, which is really one of the uh, best books I've read about Iraq in a very long time, and I think it will change uh, the way we uh, think of Iraq's history, and it will generate a lot of discussions. Uh, so I'm a big fan already, and um, the book is really, t to my mind, is amazing in terms of uh, the way it's structured and the way it's written, and you mentioned in the introduction, I think, that uh, scholars who work on Iraq often complain, rightly so, about the difficulty of accessing information and documents and archives because the country has been uh, going through wars and constant liberations. But I think this book proves that with you know um, creativity and thoroughness, one there's a lot actually that can be done with the existing documents. And uh, what's amazing is that the books, uh, as Sarah mentioned, there are certain important discursive moments, as you call them, that in much of the scholarship on Iraq, people gloss over and have been accepted as uh, foregone conclusions that you actually overturn and read in such a, um, a creative way. Um, whether it's starting from the first important chapter about the mandate period and basically the necropolitics of uh, the British British colonial control and the way, I mean, I think it, it is going to really change the way we think of the uh, reigning narratives about how Iraq becomes the bounded territory that it is and the role of uh, British bombing, of course, in kind of creating um, um, Iraq and uh, how Mandate Iraq, as you write, became a laboratory for the first large-scale imperial experiment of rule from the air and how air power was a permanent instrument of imperial administration and policing. Um, and how also, I think, um, the way you focus on psychology, basically, and how important uh, ideas of psychology were in formulating these discourses about Iraq and later with uh, Saad al-Husri and others, but how anti-colonial insurgencies could now be read as symptoms of the emotional adolescent stages, basically, and Iraqis are deemed not ready for modern forms and thus justifying British regression to violence. I think you can, you will talk later about that, and how that the figure of the child and these ideas of psychology and pedagogy that are uh, important and influenced by U.S. discourses in the post-war period then end up influencing how Iraqi subjectivity is portrayed and how certain acts of violence are justified. Um, so basically what you call defamiliarizing the story of Iraq's formation. Um, and I mean there's so much to talk about also. Um, uh, the other important contribution I think is also debunking and complicating this uh, supposed division between Arabism and Iraqism, which is Qawmi uh, and Watani, which it was often used as a binary to explain a lot of developments in Iraq history, and Sarah shows eloquently how that is pro problematic and how limited it is, and actually shows how that Arabism was compatible with and highly productive for the formation of Iraqi territorial nation state. And here we come to the very important figure of, of Saad al-Husri, who was a very important figure in the uh, formation of, of Iraqi education curricula, and also your reading there is, because the man still until today, I think, is the, what you call it, the punching bag for everyone from the right and the left, and this, uh, Sarah's reading really is uh, 
much more convincing and complicates the image and shows some really paradoxical and contradictory attitudes. Also, the other um, important and fascinating uh, reading is, again, another um, discursive moment, which is the famous Monroe Report, which a lot of scholars also gloss over, kind of like the law that Sarah mentioned, that people don't bother to really complicate and read. And the chapter on the gendering of school time uh, really shows how um, American experts, but also the Iraqi, US trained Iraqi officials that were uh, instrumental in changing and shifting school curricula in Iraq were influenced, of course, by the Monroe Report, but how it drew on vocabulary uh, that was based on, of course, education in the South and segregation, and how certain concepts and racialized concepts traveled to Iraq also and were implemented and ironically ended up reversing what was by and large a gender neutral uh, school curriculum that was unified across the country and then people suggesting that of course girls should have a different uh, actually and one I think Akrawi suggests uh, five different categories of education urban and rural and Bedouin and Kurdish and then one all for the girls so and of course, these changes would later have a lasting impact on the production of, of, of Iraqi uh, subjectivity and Iraqi identity, and ends up, of course, contributing to this, what you call freezing of the political present for the sake of this eternally deferred future. Uh, um, I think I'm already going over time, but the, the other thing that I really appreciate, which doesn't happen that often, is the genuine effort to engage Iraqi intellectuals and writers and have them as interlocutors, not just Greek chorus or something, which is really doesn't happen that often in scholarship on Iraq. Um, and I, you talked about the, the, the law, which until today, of course, especially in Iraq itself and writings in Arabic, continues to be misread and glossed over in the way you mentioned. Um, I mean, we can talk more about um, some of these other issues, which I think. So if you haven't, uh, if you're interested in Iraq, um, you should definitely buy this book and read it carefully. <laughs> And uh, I mean, the question that I couldn't, it, it's difficult not to think, of course, of the last two, three decades and to think of which uh, of the illuminating uh, concepts that you deploy can be used uh, to understand in a, in a more comprehensive way what's happening. I mean, uh, of course, the other great thing is how, you know, show that sect, how sect and tribe were deployed in Iraq's history as tools of distancing, and the most fascinating, uh, one of the many fascinating concepts in this book is how it uses time and temporality and complicates Anderson's understanding. But you, uh, towards the end, you say the reach of the state into intimate life continue to expand in the name of producing subjects worthy of sovereignty and capable of economic development. By that, of course, you mean, I know that you stop at the uh, coup for a variety of reasons, but I, I would be interested to see what continuities and discontinuities you see with the regime in Iraq in the, after 63 and 68, and how we should rethink the uh, massive campaign to eradicate illiteracy, and how that also is a continuation of uh, previous efforts. Um, so that would be one question. The other question is, and um, you know, the epilogue is really uh, brilliant, which was, I heard Sarah um, talk about it uh, a few months ago at Santa Barbara, but it's a uh, really brilliant reading of the famous uh, monument by Jawad Salim in the heart of Baghdad, but that's used also to offer different readings, but also to offer maybe a, hot, a reading that breaks with most of the previous readings to look at the monument as maybe a heterogeneous or a different way of looking at time and temporality that tries to avoid the linearity and things of that sort. The, the, I mean, what 
There are a lot of potential graduate students, and now that I'm an old man, I'm in the habit of telling people we should go and work on this, on that. But I think actually the concept deployed and the, and the um, insights in the book would give a lot to, to think about and reread, especially in terms of um, literature, because if that's my field, and I was wondering if you were tempted or ideally how one could expand on some of these ideas and chapters to go beyond just Joel Selim, which is a lot, not that you need to go beyond that, but in terms of literary writings in the in the Republican period, especially that a lot of these intellectuals and poets, of course, were themselves uh, actually in the field of education, which is such an important site that that you read in the book. And sorry because I've already said so too much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks so much um, for those comments. Um, so uh, I'll start with the questions. I may well say a few things also about some other things that you brought up. Um, so the question about uh, my own writing, I just wrote. Uh, the last uh, two to three decades and um, sort of you know, whether what I'm talking about or what way it might um, help us understand what's happening now or just generally the continuities and discontinuities um, after 1963. So I'll say a couple things. I mean, one, um, you know, I, I didn't talk about it, but it's not talk about it in his comments. It's chapter one that looks at um, the British rule of Iraq, um, and I sort of argue that, um, I mean, it's well known, actually, this is not an argument, it's well known that, that this was Britain's first um, experiment in rule from the air, and uh, let's try not <coughs> occupying a colony uh, with ground troops, let's try ruling them by dropping bombs on them uh, with airplanes. This was an explicit um, experiment with Iraq. Uh, Iraq was moved um, to the Royal Air Force, was officially in charge of the Iraq um, colony, mandate. Um, as it was called. Um, and, you know, uh, so historians have, have looked at this before, um, but they've kind of understood it, I think, in um, some weird ways. Uh, which, uh, I don't know if I want to go into that um, so much. Um, but because, <laughs> because they're all about uh, sort of trying to think about this British rule in some other colonial, in some other col earlier colonial pattern. Like, you know, is it like um, is it more like Egypt? Is it more like India? Is it more like uh, Foucault's pre-modern, um, you know, spectacular forms of power? Like, it doesn't really look like modern disciplinary power, like everyone writes about with Egypt all the time, you know, because they're dropping bombs on people from airplanes. Um, and, I mean, what it looks like is now. I mean, it looks more like now than, you know, why do we have to go back um, before the early 20th century? I mean, I think it's much more similar to later imperial forms of intervention than it um, is to any earlier forms. Um, and I. Uh, I teach a course in Iraq here sometimes, um, undergraduate course, and some of my students from last semester are here. Um, and one of the things you know we look at is how Iraq has sort of been central in uh, various ways to um, various forms of imperial rule over the last um, uh, century, more than a century. And um, this phenomenon of air, you know, it was it was the experiment in rule from the air for Britain, and then later becomes you know now it's, it's became one of the experiments in uh, in rule by drone. <laughs> I don't want to say rule by drone, but punishment by drone for sure. Um, you know, along with Afghanistan and, and some other places. Um, so, you know, I think thinking about these uh, forms of power and how they relate um, is um, useful um, because it is different than uh, these sort of biopolitical interventions that um, people in the Middle East uh, history have been more interested in. Um, another uh, continuity I'll talk about or uh, just mention is. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the book looks at um, how you know, family reform projects um, are often about uh, trying to demobilize various populations. Like I look at one project where um, land, rural, uh, landless, poor people are resettled on these isolated family farms, right, that are separated from each other specifically to, to try to reduce their uh, capacities for mobilization. It's a social and ecological disaster, as I write about in the chapter. It has nothing to do with increasing agricultural productivity because it completely fails in that way. Um, uh, but the point was just to, to fix people in these small family farms. Um, this was based on this American uh, grain reform theory of family farming. Um, so I look at these various ways in which family reform is often about, um, about demobilization and depoliticization. And I draw uh, a lot of Jack Gonzalo's uh, policing of families um, concept, where um, the, sort of understood in this double sense where um, the state and other uh, entities of governmentality are policing of families, and then families are, are being taught how to police each other, police uh, the members inside the family. Um, 
And this, I mean, the bath regimes that come after 1963, I mean, are just the most nightmare example of this, I think. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that in the book, that, you know, the processes I look at um, later really become a nightmare for Iraqi adults, where these interventions in family life uh, in the name of the care of children um, become a way for the Ba'ath state to use children to inform on the political statements and activities of their parents, right? So parents um, can't even speak openly in the house because uh, their children will be encouraged to inform on them um, through schools or through other uh, sort of social uh, reform um, entities. So I think that's um, important to think about um, also. Um, the uh, campaign, you know, the campaigns against uh, illiteracy, I mean, one thing the Ba'ath did is um, sort of uh, co-opted in many ways what the uh, Iraqi communist women were doing before. Um, so, uh, you know, the Basque, uh, you know, they wipe out the communists basically in the beginning, and then they start their own women's organization. The communist women's organization, uh, uh, the popular front organization for women that the communist um, party set up, became the Iraqi feminist movement. I mean, it was the Iraqi feminist movement in the 1950s. It was called the League for the Defense of Women's Rights, and I actually started out um, really looking at that before I got to the personal status law. And they, um, get into a lot of trouble in the revolutionary era when they um, start this rural um, literacy project. So they start going into rural areas to combat um, illiteracy. Um, and it becomes this major public conflict in Iraq. And it's actually used by the government to justify shutting down the, um, the, the Communist Party's daily newspaper, which was the largest circulating part, uh, paper in the country. So again, these conflicts over gender were really central um, to this period. Um, and the women were trying to frame their work in sort of apolitical terms. We're not doing it, we're just telling these, you know, women how to cook and sew, and we're teaching them home economics. And you know, they were communists going to the countryside. You know, no one believed them, but that's all they were talking about. Um, and so, you know, this, and they were actually banned from the entire, actually all teachers were banned. Uh, they couldn't go into the rural southern areas of Iraq for any non-official reason if they didn't have permission. Um, because it was school teachers and uh, college students and even high school students who were doing this as communist women. Um, so the Ba'ath try to pick the, this up. I mean, they pick up some of the structures uh, left by this communist women's organization that was obliterated in 1963 um, through their General Federation of Women, um, which is, um, so that's one way, that, one thing that they pick up is this, uh, literacy. Not, not, I mean, I'm not saying the Ba'ath wouldn't have been combating literacy anyways, but they do sort of set up structurally um, a very similar kind of system using uh, women um, uh, for these social reform um, projects. Um, Um, I attempted to expand. I attempted to expand on everything. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I always felt like, uh, yeah. There's, you know, there's just so little written on mm -hmm. Iraq. Um, I, you know, you know, a million books could come out of my book and everyone else's book. I mean, so yeah, I don't really know how to answer the question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm totally sure yet what my second uh, project will be. Um, but yes, the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> um, the liter. I mean, the liter. I know you're writing actually specifically about literary writings and. Um, yeah, right now, my second book project is actually looking more at this land settlement um, uh, phenomenon, these family farms and, and their sort of ecological and environmental um, effects as well as their social effects. So that's where I'm, I'm headed right now, is expanding on that. I um, also just want to say briefly, uh, Sinan brought it up, and um, um, I didn't talk about this, but I'll say a little bit about this, uh, which is also maybe a way to say something about the title, Familiar Features. Um, one thing I look at in uh, one of the chapters is um, this. Uh, this American Commission who comes to Iraq in 1932 of education experts. Uh, 1932 is the year Iraq is formally independent and joins the League of Nations. They invite this American team of experts, they're education experts up town at Columbia Teachers College, um, and they and, uh, you know, ask them to evaluate the Iraqi school system. And one thing this, uh, this uh, commission says is um, they're horrified that Iraq is giving girls and boys the same education, as Sanan mentioned, right? Girls and boys were segregated in different schools, but they followed the same curriculum, they had the same exams, you know, they had the same education. <coughs> And the Americans said, no, 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 you can't do this. You, you have to be teaching. You're never going to develop. You're never going to modernize. You have to be teaching your girls home economics. This has to be required um, field of study in, in all your schools. And this, you know, one thing I point out, you know, this was just uh, the commission members assumed that they knew what Iraq's future looked like because it looked like their own present, right? This, in the 1930s, in the United States, home economics was a required field of study for all girls in public schools, you know, all the way up until 1972 with Title, Title IX is what makes it illegal to have sex-based um, requirements in public schools. Um, until then, girls are required to take home economics. So for the commission members, um, you know, it's just this remarkable confidence that they know what modernity looks like because it looks like they're present. Um, so one thing I think about is how this concept of a modernity that already, already, you know, always already exists in the West is this strange, static concept of what modernity is. We think of modernity as being about change and newness and, um, and all that, but in many ways it's about the stasis, both in the West and in some ways then um, also in Iraq and in 
So that's one sense of familiar futures. Iraq's future is familiar because it's already somebody else's past or present, right? Mm -hmm. It's past or present of the West. We know what it looks like, and it's only one of them, right? The current, uh, the current West. Um, and then familiar futures, in another sense, is kind of contradictory to that, is Iraq's futures are familiar because they keep looking like Iraq's present, right? So this is the sort of freezing, the things that end up freezing um, various aspects of um, Iraq's political structure, say, in place, right? We can't have democracy, we have to maintain uh, military rule for now. Um, or earlier, um, uh, just went right out of my head. Um, oh, there was this discourse uh, all the way up to 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, the British were saying it, and these American experts, and then even the, the UN, the development agencies, that Iraq will always be an agricultural country. Right? Iraq has always been an agricultural country. It will be an agricultural country forever. And so what development means is trying to increase agricultural productivity and keep people from moving to the cities and keep people from developing ambitions um, uh, that will get, uh, encourage them to leave rural areas. This was a consistent discourse, including at the development agencies that arrived there after World War um, II. So that's one familiar feature. Iraq's future is familiar because it's going to stay the same. It's not going to industrialize, right? It's going to stay in its current location in the global um, economy. And here these experts, um, as Sinan mentioned, were um, uh, drawing directly on, uh, in fact, they, some of them came directly <coughs> from segregated schooling projects for black youth in the U.S. South, from the Hampton Tuskegee Institutes. Um, in fact, there was a really strong connection between Columbia Teachers College and those institutes at this time, and they were both funded by um, the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, so, you know, one of the guys who arrives in Iraq is a well-known, he was a well-known um, uh, supporter of segregation, of the disenfranchise, disenfranchisement of black southerners, of Jim Crow laws. Right, and he arrives in Iraq and then writes this uh, recommendation um, basically saying you have to teach girls home economics and you have to teach most of your boys agricultural skills, manual labor, and keep them in the countryside. So I'm looking at you know, the reproduction of uneven development is part of what I'm looking at, both within the nation state you know, and uh, globally. Um, now I'm probably saying too much, so I'll stop there. No, no, I mean, I mean in, this, in, this, in this context, what was fascinating to me was this whole slowing down time in the primary classroom as but part of the temporal lengthening of childhood itself and suppression of precocity, but also how Monroe warned against continued expansion of uh, education because the youth will become a menace to political stability. Of course, I mean, it's one of these fascinating insights. And, um, and also how the, the, for, for the, the, the influence of the pragmatists and pragmatism and how Literacy, they thought, was secondary to healthy habits and conduct. So, this is great quote is that sane, healthy, and illiterate children are more fortunate than anemic and unhealthy youth who can read and write. <laughs> and then this uh, abhorrence to memorization uh, and the critique of certain forms of education and or learning, but and to make the capacity to forget a virtue and children and kind of detach. Uh, individuals from their from their past and then bound them to this impossible future of course it's, uh, it's brilliant so I don't want to I, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that a little bit I say one thing about that because I'm thinking about more for a uh, second book is um, one thing I sort of didn't make it into the book version it's a little bit in the dissertation but um, I talk about this concept um, the mobile personality, right, which was, what's his name, Daniel Lerner's idea, of, was one of the requirements of modernization mm -hmm. yeah, specifically in the Middle East, the passing of traditional society in the Middle East, right, in that book. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the mobile personality as a requirement of modernization. So I think about the mobile personality, or I want to think more about it in relation to this pragmatist concept. So we're talking about, you know, Dewey and pragmatism, but then it gets used or misused, we could debate that in various ways around the world. Dewey actually goes to Turkey and writes a not a report that's not dis totally dissimilar from the real report. Um, so the, the pragmatist cosmopolitan, um, cos the homeless mind and the cosmopolitan individual. So thinking about how these projects aim to, as Sinan said, detach um, youth especially from uh, various kinds of attachments to uh, their local communities, right? Various kinds of memories, right? I mean, the, the way in which pragmatists and other modernizing reformers just go after modernization, not just as a waste of time, but as actively harmful, is really interesting, right? <laughs> that, memor that, that having a skill of memorization is, is actively um, degrading or harmful to children. Um, so I want to think more about this sort of cutting loose of children's psyches in various ways uh, uh, through this mobile personality and homeless mind um, idea. Um, in the context of uh, these development projects. I took out the books, I haven't quite, uh, I haven't explored this as much as I should, but that's one thing I want to think more about. What other things did you take out of the book? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can read the dissertation if you're <laughs> <laughs> um, 
What about Al Husni? Could you say more about the why you uh, reread him and how what what you kind of suggest as to look at him differently in terms of the division between Arabism and Iraqism and also the sectarian charges against him and, yeah. and the, the paradox of what you see. No, that's yeah. Um, so Al Husri is a, I mean, he's, he's most well known for being one of the leading Arab nationalist thinkers um, in, in the interwar period. So he was you know, widely read outside of Iraq also um, as an Arab nationalist. Um, but I think his more interesting writings are actually on the education system and on pedagogy and psychology in Iraq. I mean, I think he has actually really interesting things to say. So um, partly I'm just uh, looking at him in that. I mean, he's one reason that the, Iraq ended up with this school system that uh, gave girls and boys the same education, you know, which was pretty rare in the 1920s and 30s. I mean, it's not like you know, home economics was already you know, well instituted in most places um, in the world. So he had this idea of a unified education system. He was a, a, a strong critic of the Monroe Report, of its um, efforts to divide, especially to divide um, rural and urban um, education between youth and to restrict uh, uh, rural youth to uh, manual labor skills. Um, he wrote some really great critiques about that. And he basically thought the Monroe Report was just uh, you know, colonialism in a new language, language of pragmatism. Um, so I think he makes just some really interesting um, critiques of uh, some of what's going on. Um, you know, the Monroe Report, by the way, in Iraqi historiography, has been sort of universally described as this um, bringing of democracy to the Iraqi education system, right? Because people just assume that's what Americans are doing, you know, in the 30s, is bringing democracy throughout the world and, and equality of educational opportunity, totally ignoring the completely racist system that, um, that is <coughs> coming out of. Um, so his critiques of the Monroe Report are, are, are really um, excellent. Um, his Arabism, you know, yeah, you, wrote, you know, he was, uh, um, actually, I wouldn't say he was uh, anti kurdish he was an anti he was, an anti, he was an Arab nationalist that was trying, who was trying to assimilate um, uh, children into Arab nationalism, right? So he certainly didn't want um, Kurds to leave Iraq, right? <laughs> um, but he did want them to speak Arabic. So he's been uh, rightly criticized for his Arabism, right? For his exclusionary, you know, Arabism in Iraq was an exclusionary ideology and um, obviously very problematic for Kurds and for um, Iraq and for Shia Arabs to some extent in Iraq and for um, Christian and Jewish minorities um, in Iraq. Um, so, you know, some of the critiques of, of him are perfectly justified. I'm, I'm not totally sure um, how interesting they are at this point, because they've been said so many times, and also because he's a nationalist. That's what nationalists do, is they exclude. So, so this um, obsessive focus on al Husri, I don't totally understand. Um, that well, I think that recently, more and more, it's in the kind of the sunni Shiri new sectarian discourse, because oftentimes this controversy he had with al Jawahari about his visit to Iran and all of that. It's nowadays every other week it's invoked in, in some Iraqi mm -hmm. publications. So that's why it's refreshing to read this this account. And I think it will be very important to kind of reconceptualize what what he was rather than a, just an anti-Shiite uh, Sunni ideologue. That it's a more complicated form of Arab nationalism, and, but also you say that kind of geared towards creating an Iraqism in a way. Mm -hmm. That this binary between Arabism and Iraqism doesn't hold in his, in his work. Yeah, even in his memoirs, which he wrote several decades after all of this and after he became a leading Arabist spokesman, he talks about how King Faisal's main accomplishment in Iraq was, was establishing Iraq's borders. That that was the purpose of, of not kicking out the British immediately, of keeping the British um, Air Force there to help create Iraq's borders, and that was Faisal's biggest achievement. People write about history saying he was against Iraq's borders. They were created artificially. He wasn't against Iraq's borders at all. He did consider it the first step towards Arab Union, but but in many ways, you know, what he's working within the framework of the Iraqi territorial state and working to create this bounded territorial um, state. And a philosophy like Arabism, you know, one thing I argue is not opposed to the building of an Iraqi territorial state. I mean, many states uh, build themselves through a concept of a. Uh, in fact, uh, what gets instituted with the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. Um, is the concept of a majority race and minority races. So every nation state is now understood to have one majority race and some you know, X number of minority races. So this Arabism um, as a way to help form the Iraqi territorial state was completely consistent with this, right? Um, Arabs are the majority, this was the argument, right? And so Arab kind of, Arabism kind of came, became the you know, sort of uh, hegemonic um, Iraqi selfhood. Right? There's a I have a chapter called Determining a Self and that's part of what the self became was um, Arab self was uh, was dominant, but that is not um, unlike how many other nation states were formed, right? So this I, so this idea that Arabism and Iraqism were always working against each other, it just really doesn't apply for the for the interwar period. 
later becomes a real problem. So the, the other issue is this, of course, the um, this age of Shabab and how, in a way, it was something went wrong for Iraqi education officials because the schools were not producing docile young men, but were producing the opposite, actually. I'm just mentioning that because also it kind of resonates with certain debates now in, in Iraq and elsewhere about the problem of the, of the youth. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit at that moment in particular. Yeah, so I would, you know, yeah, so chapter on um, kind of the, the immediate post, the wartime and immediate post World War II um, period, when this new this generation emerges, um, is considered a problem by people like El History and other people who have established the education system. Basically, basically, all the youth are joining the Communist Party. I mean, that's the basic problem, according to the Iraqi um, <laughs> officials. So it was extremely popular, it's totally underground, it's extremely popular among um, the Iraqi youth, especially. Um, so, you know, now they have, and there was, a, what I write in the chapter is how they, in some ways, they were especially concerned about girls, all the girls joining the Iraqi Communist Party, you know, because here they've been implementing this um, system of home economics, right, to teach girls to be good mothers and housewives, and now what they were saying is it was having the opposite effect, right, it was, uh, education was making girls resistant to marriage and motherhood, and they were all running off joining the Communist Party. Um, so I have a chapter that looks, um, that looks at that, partly uh, to look at this, um, these ideas of drawn from psychology and ideas about adolescence and the stage of adolescence and sort of the new fears around that. And of course, it's a global phenomenon too, right? This is the post-war moment, and you know, uh, youth uh, were considered a problem in many parts of the world at this uh, moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know uh, what to say about that right now, but um, I, mean, I could say a lot. But, uh, yeah, so, definitely. all right. So maybe we can open it to the audience to ask questions. Hi. You said you were complicating or announced uh, and there's still only an understanding of time, national time, the of time. Could you say a little bit more about this? So who's con Anderson's Anderson. contribution? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, um, <coughs> So, uh, Benedict Anderson, um, yeah, I say that in the book? Or it's not, it's not it came up. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Criticizing or, you know, complicating his understanding of yeah. nation. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I use Benedict Anderson. I mean, I think, it, I think Benedict Anderson's concept of historical time is really important. I mean, so I don't totally just uh, dismiss it. I mean, I think it's one of his most important interventions is um, this idea that our capacity to uh, imagine nationhood, modern nationhood, depends on our learned capacity to imagine linear historical time. I mean, I, I definitely, I think there's, um, that's an important, really important um, insight. Um, one way I complicate it is just by bringing gender um, into the picture. So this uh, concept of homogeneous time gets complicated when you look at the ways um, in which uh, various kinds of difference, including sexual difference, are seen um, as also propelling historical time in a way that is not exactly homogeneous, right? It, it um, requires these, um, these constructions of binary um, difference. So I can say so much about this because it's really, um, this um, runs through the book in lots of ways. Um, I'll say, okay, another way um, is I draw on a different um, theorist, um, Lee Edelman, um, his book, No Future of Queer Theory and the Death Drive, and he, um, I use his concept or I use my adaptation of his concept of reproductive futurism, um, which in my use of it, this is more my language than his, um, reproductive futurism is a, a hegemonic imaginary of modernity that um, uh, sort of puts on the, he calls it the figure of the child. So it, um, the nation's future, in the case of Iraq, he doesn't talk about the nation, but the nation's future gets embodied in the figure of the child, right? It's this innocent child, right? Which sort of cuts down all arguments you might make against whatever argument is being made in the name of the child, right? Um, no one can argue against the, the innocence of the child. Um, and it ends up being um, the, <coughs> the child, the future the child is standing for and the child is embodying ends up being this constantly receding future, right? The child never grows up, the future never arrives, but these arguments are constantly made to justify curtailing the rights of adults um, in the present, right? So that's, that's how I kind of use the concept of reproductive futurism, which is um, different from, you know, Anderson's concept of just this linear time that we're moving through. So, you know, I, I think, I guess that's the second main way I complicate Anderson's argument is to look at these various forms of deferral and stasis that are also really important to modern um, uh, experiences and conceptions of time. I also got Reinhard, because I mean, I said Reinhard Kaselik and, um, and Lee Edelman are, are the theorists I engage with more in temporality than, um, than Anderson, really, in the end. 
so one thing I, what I just said reminded me of one, one, one aspect I use of Pacellic is his idea of a, um, that in modernity there's this ever widening gap between the space of experience and the horizon of expectation, right? And he says in modern revolutionary time that's when this gap is biggest. Um, you know, the revolution appears to, to, um, to inaugurate this uh, future, but then the, the nature of the revolution kind of robs the presence of materiality and actuality. So again, we have this constantly receding future that can never actually be um, realized. So, so I want to look at these sort of ruptures and, um, and deferrals that Anderson really doesn't get to. land 
was designated the, the head of the household in the nuclear family. He had to be between 18 and 50 years of age. He had to be married. He had to have at least one child. All these requirements um, based on this notion of a nuclear family model. So I argue that this family model is extremely important. It reshaped people's lives. It literally changed the land, destroyed the land, because these family farms were, required intensive methods of agriculture. There was no uh, infrastructure to sustain intensive methods of agriculture in this environment. So that all the land turned to salt within 20 years, which they knew was going to happen. Um, so, you know, it's both different from the Western concept of the conjugal family and um, the conjugal family, the, the nuclear family structure is extremely um, productive um, in these development projects, just not in a way that it's often, um, not in the way we're often looking for it to be. Um, thank you both. Um, I can't wait to read the book. Um, I had a question about one of the lines of the, of the argument that's most intriguing to me is the kind of segregation logic that you um, talk about in terms of the pedagogic role of these modernizers, and then also the resistance or the opposition to the Shi I don't remember the name of the Shiite um, leader who was um, opposing um, opposing these kinds of uh, positions. And I just wonder if you could expand a little bit on this, because it seems, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, like knowing the cases of Turkey and India a little bit better, same period, why it is that in Iraq they are making this case about rural versus urban? Because Daniel Lerner's book is, is, is about urbanization, right? It's about pushing people from rural areas into urban areas as a, as a uh, you know, a, 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 a road to modernity. So I'm just wondering what makes what the, the, the different, and you know, obviously in India you have a, a massive rural population, so I'm, I'm kind of curious about the difference, and uh, Turkey too. But I'm also interested in the kind of segregation and logic that goes into this, um, because you talked about the racial segregation in the US shaping the way that these projects are imagined. But then I'm also curious, are the people who are opposing these logics thinking about, for example, in the 1930s, Du Bois's critique of the UN about racial segregation? So is that conversation happening? So I, yeah, I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Right. Um, yeah, so. But Guma and I have debated this, not debated it, we discussed it. Is this a historical difference or are we looking at, are we analyzing it differently? Right. Because she wrote a book in Turkey about how, yeah, it's yeah, urbanization is encouraged, yeah. right? That they're, um, they're encouraging modernization of really radical rupture, right? right. The highways and hotels. Right. Um, so I think, oh, we haven't come to any conclusions about whether it's a <laughs> historical difference or a difference in our analysis. Um, but I do think there are some differences. I and mean, I think Turkey was different from Iraq in this, mm -hmm. in this, um, in this way. Um, I don't know how different, but it would really be interesting to sort of look at John Dewey's report on Turkey, and because one thing he's also arguing that you know rural boys need to give uh, education and agricultural <laughs> skills. Um, I mean, John Dewey's not a you know he's not a segregationist, but um, he's it would be interesting to explore that. One. Mm -hmm. um, in Iraq, you know, so I don't so I, the answer is I don't know what in what ways it's different from and similar to other places um, in this way. It certainly, you know, when the UN starts arriving and the US.4 um, agencies and the Ford Foundation and the World Bank, um, it's a pretty consistent discourse in Iraq among all of those agencies, right? Um, that Iraq is an agricultural country and we need to keep the rural youth in the rural areas. In the 50s, you know, again, I'm ending in 63, mm -hmm. so when you start getting into the, you know, the Green Revolution and all that, it probably changes. Right. Um, so that sort of answers the question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <coughs> the other part of the question? The racial kind of right. Question. Was this a debate? You know, I have not seen it as a debate in mm -hmm. Iraq in this time. I mean, I quote Du Bois in here um, because um, partly because I'm criticizing these Iraq scholars who see the Monroe Report as this uh, democracy and equal opportunity, mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of pointing out that um, you know why why is it Paul Monroe um, who led this commission? Um, you know, he's promoting all these ideas that are extremely controversial in his home country, mm -hmm. right? So I quote Du Bois on how, you know, the white world wants the black world to study agriculture because it makes it easier to lynch, you know, it's easier to lynch Negroes in the living country districts. And, you know, so this debate is totally going on. Mm -hmm. um, I have not seen it um, in Iraq, except El Husri, who is so critical of the Monroe Report, but he doesn't seem aware of these debates either because he suspects, I mean, he actually says it sounds like they're like, re when they describe the Iraqi schools, they're recycling narratives that they came in with. Um, they are. I mean, I've looked at the earlier reports in the Philippines and China and Mexico, you know, they say the exact same thing about every school system they look at. Um, and then Iraq scholars use this as an actual empirical description of Iraqi schools. <laughs> um, so that's, yeah, so I have not seen that debate happening in Iraq. It certainly is happening. But I wonder if it contrib it's contributed partly to this construction of this figure of the Maidan and who are the, 
menace to a lot of other ideas about hygiene and all of that, and that continues until today. The figure of the of the Madan as kind of the other of the Baghdadi cosmopolitan middle class. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is partly influenced by these ideas coming from from the U.S. Yeah, and I should say the debates are going on. Should rural boys be restricted to agriculture education? I mean, that debate is certainly going on. It's just um, I haven't seen it being connected to the debates about racial segregation in the U.S. Yeah. Or, or elsewhere. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Congratulations on the book. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk about the word development in Arabic when it comes to. Um, I mean, you, have a nice, you explain nicely the amb ambiguity of the meaning, particularly in British colonial development discourse and uh, the dual doctrine of development that, that emerges uh, in the 19, by the 20s, 1930s. But do you see similar degrees of ambiguity in the words that get used for development in Arabic uh, in, on the Iraqi side? And if, if you do, is that important? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. I would like to write a history of sort of the concept of development and the terms used for development in Arabic. Um, that's one thing I'm tempted to do. <laughs> um, yeah, so there are more words used than in English. Um, so to tower, tenia, I mean, you get different words and then it sort of some become differently popular over time. Um, they don't have the same, so one thing uh, Gabe's referring to is that one really interesting thing about the term economic development in English is, you know, another scholar has pointed this out, is um, the way in which by 1945 it comes to operate totally ambiguously, grammatically, like whether it's transitive or intransitive. So by 1945, when someone says the economic development of Iraq, you have no idea whether they're referring to Iraq as a subject developing in time or as an object being developed, right? So it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's one of the sort of productive ways in which economic development works in this really ambiguous, um, many ambiguous kinds of ways. Um, and I actually explore that. I'm actually sort of interested in Iraq um, I got interested later between the dissertation and the book. So some of the new book chapters are based on looking at this sort of um, the way in which Iraq, uh, it's not unique, but it's a really productive place for looking at the history of economic development in the interwar period um, for various reasons. Because different concepts of development, uh, which I argue come together to form this post-war concept of economic development, are really prominent in Iraq for various reasons. Like economic development, that term used to basically mean the, the extraction of resources um, of a colonized territory by a colonial power. That's what it meant. So economic development of India meant um, extracting um, India's resources. Uh, it's, Similar to how we use develop, development of real estate right now. That's what economic development meant, was, was developing uh, land, specifically in a colonized territory. Um, then development uh, started coming um, around the turn of the 20th century, started being used for peoples who develop, right? Nations or peoples. And this gets enshrined in the League of Nations a mandate system in Article 22, which talks about the development of peoples of the former like Ottoman Empire, so that includes Iraq. So Iraq sort of positioned in the mandate system in a particular phase of development, the, fa the A phase, which was like the adolescent phase, it was also B and a C phase, um, was about the development of peoples through time. That was the language that was used. And then you also have a development um, in a kind of psychological, biological, psychological sense. And one thing I argue is that these three concepts start coming together um, in the interwar period um, in sort of interesting ways, and then it becomes very strong concept by um, the end of World War II. And it's the coming together of those concepts that gives economic development, which used to mean the exploitation of land, this like incredible moral sense. Like suddenly this is this moral argument that you could hardly even argue against. Like of course we need economic development before anything else. Um, but I think the morality of that, um, the post-war concept, really comes from the ways in which those other concepts um, got sort of um, pulled into. <laughs> that was a, a brief English history of the train. Um, <laughs> um, so the quick answer is no. You don't have the same ambiguity in the Arabic terms, partly because there are different um, verb forms used. You can't quite do the transitive and the intransitive in the same way. Um, but uh, but they are used. Um, they are used in the same way in the sense that you get the development of um, characters, the development of people, and the development of land. Um, you get like ten mia, you know, by 1950s is used for all of those um, sort of to come together in this um, way that development is used in English too. So it would be really interesting history to do that, um, but that's my Because we have memo, we're, memo and ten are different, right? I mean, so it's interesting that in that case you actually, the, the differences is kind of clear in the... Exactly, because one's transit and one's in transit, yeah, right? right. One, yeah, so, right. yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so But I was wondering how much you think that sort of mentality 
hard question. I mean, I do think they've changed, but obviously, um, you know, uh, there are also continuities and resonances. Um, I think your question makes me think of is this is a poster down here, a big, I don't know, poster. It's everywhere in Egypt of, uh, of a military, I mean, it's under CC's merch, I think, of a military guy holding a baby, right? This is in several books that many people have written. Maybe. I can't remember what books it's in. Um, it's this intense image, right? And people see it looming over them in um, Egypt. And I was, uh, actually, Joan Scott and I were commenting on it that it makes us nostalgic for reproductive futurism. <laughs> but now it's like a military guy holding his baby, and this is our protector, right? It was actually much better when it was the woman and the child. Um, so, so, so I don't know exactly what to say to uh, answer the question, but it's different, uh, in some ways scarier. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't think it's the exact same sort of um, linear idea of childhood to adolescence to um, adulthood. Um, I mean, one thing I suggest, more in an article I've written than in the book, that um, the, you know, these youth movements of the 50s and 60s, which I think are completely related to decolonization, um, uh, sort of change the, uh, the, um, the way in which adolescence is understood, right? They, they, they are related to um, the ways in which adolescence comes to be celebrated as, a, as a, a positive kind of political rebellion. So I think you know, the history of decolonization is relevant to how these terms get um, uh, challenged and um, upended in some ways, and then sort of uh, people attempt to reappropriate them, right? Uh, but we also have to look at the ways in which decolonization um, disrupted a lot of these um, narratives. Um, and yeah, so I'll just I don't know if I, if I understood correctly, but I mean, education in Iraq after the British uh, uh, colonization, and even up to the 63, the Ba'ath Party, Iraq regarding education is the most, is the best country regarding education in the Middle East. And there were no restriction on either boys or girls from primary school from primary up to high school. Even sometimes, if there are no, because in Iraq, in the high school, the, uh, the system, you have two options, either you go to the scientific or to the non-scientific, literature other. So sometimes in some school, if there are girls and there is no, not enough to be enrolled, they can join the boys. They can join boy high school. That is how the freedom for, for education was. That's amazing. I think, no, I think I, I mean, in Iraq, education is the best. I mean, you can't just leave Iraq from high school, go everywhere in the world, and get the highest degree. It's interesting, even in the time period of looking at the 20s, 30s, and 40s, you often hear people um, say, like, the Monroe Commission said this when they did to her a little bit and asked people a few questions. <laughs> Um, and you know, one thing they said was just how amazed they were at how uh, the support for girls' education they felt like it was like universal, like everyone was clamoring for girls' education. Um, so you know, of course, it wasn't everyone, and there was some controversy, but there has been significant amount of support for girls' education actually through the 20th century um, in Iraq. Um, and yeah, I mean, under the Ba'ath regime, you know, girls were educated. I mean, um, I actually did want to sort of acknowledge. Um, uh, I was going to say this at the beginning, but you know, this uh, the month of March is the, um, the anniversary of the. the catastrophic and illegal U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, Sanat and I were at uh, um, uh, UC Santa Barbara last year. They invited us to come out and commemorate the 15th anniversary. This is the 16th anniversary. We're going to, uh, some grad students here have organized an event for the end of the month on Iraq. Um, so you can check out the Kilo Center website. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that. Yes, I mean, um, the education system was destroyed. Um, you know, things are not better for women in Iraq than they were um, before. Um, we, could say, we could say a lot about that. I mean, if I might add, some very simple point is that the, one of the many destructive effects of the, the wars and the invasions is this nostalgia, that uh, unreflective nostalgia that so many Iraqis are hostage to, which is very problematic because it kind of clouds the way we think of the past. And so, you know, what's, what's fascinating about, about this book, one of the many things is how it Kind of very nuances the the and carefully reads the changes in with very uh, uh, thorough research based on, on archives and documents to show you the the slight changes in the complicates the history of education in Iraq uh, 
But of course, because of what has been happening since 1991, we and the disastrous condition now in Iraq, which has the highest number of fake diplomas in the Middle East, so of course that ends up. Uh, that's why I mean, Sadi Yusuf, the primary Iraqi poet, calls nostalgia my enemy because he calls nostalgia an enemy because it clouds how we think of the country's history. So it's a minor point, but it's something that we should all remember. And that also, if I may add. <laughs> no, that it's true. That's why, in a way, my question was about the, 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 the campaign of eradication of, lit of illiteracy that the Ba'ath carried out, and also kind of the extending all the services to the marshes in Iraq, which, of course, in the regime's propaganda was portrayed as this, you know, it's development, it's progress, but of course it was to make sure that no corner in the country was beyond the, the gaze of the, of the state. But that also, the problem, since we're talking about temporality and time, is that, you know, seeing when the decline happens in, in Iraqi uh, institutions and the weakening of the state starts in 1991, but also it was already and I, although I, I graduated from, from Iraq, but it was already being under the heavy weight of the uh, nightmare, as you call it, the nightmare of, of Iraqi life under the Ba'ath, already the educational system was beginning to suffer. When I was studying English literature, and this is the experience of others, uh, competent professors who had you know, excellent uh, credentials from major world universities were being replaced, who were not willing to join the Ba'ath Party, were being replaced by Ba'athist professors who didn't know what they were doing. So just to complicate the issue of when things begin to deteriorate. But anyway, that's for another day. It's just a break before you guys ask this ne next question. <laughs> Fire questions from behind you. Um, I I was also really um, uh, struck by this. Um, your mentioning of this uh, Shi cleric uh, and, and his critique of the of the family law, um, partly because it, it kind of uh, foreshadows at least the the brief snapshot that you gave sort of foreshadows um, this argument that's um, kind of become uh, very popular now in in study of Islamic jurisprudence. Um, especially, you know, people who are kind of inspired by Talal Assad mm -hmm. will make this um, kind of um, this argument that uh, you know the transposition of Islamic jurisprudence to nation-state law kind of eviscerates this sort of form of ethical self-cultivation or self-care um, that is part of the jurisprudential process. Um, but what's interesting about that, uh, I think, in in light of the, you know, you're dealing with time and temporality is that that sort of involves its own form of deferral um, in terms of, like, um, you know, Brinkley Messick's critique of this would be, like, that the focus on the ethical self-care kind of defers the moment of juridical decision-making, that sort of the moment when the potty has to sort of make a ruling or whatever. So at the risk of, I don't want to sort of read all of that back into the, this uh, cleric writing, you know, decades earlier, but it does make me wonder to what extent, um, you know, with these, in, in terms of these sort of uh, critiques of the of, um, you know, nation-state narratives, whether we're sort of dealing with competing, I don't know, ethics of deferral or competing sort of teleologies or um, if there's, you know, a broader... Right. Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I would like. I would like. This is another thing I'm tempted to explore more. Is these questions. Um, so Hamid Bahar al Alum, that's his name, the Shia cleric um, who wrote this book, um, and he. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about. I talked about two. What sort of registers I had in mind for the book's title, Familiar Features. Um, there's actually four that I talk about in the introduction, and the fourth one is. Um, I'm trying to think about uh, futures that are familiar, futures that would be familiar because they're not constantly receding, right? So 
Um, so one way I think about this is through Bahar al-Alum's um, idea of uh, the temporality of Islamic law, right? And, and it is similar to the Talal al Assad idea. Um, this is a temporality that, that links past, present, and future, right, in a different way from this modern linear historical time. It is linear in some ways, right? Um, but it, because uh, there is a past, present, and a future in it, but it has this um, way of, of changing that is different. Um, so, so by familiar here, I mean both that um, some of these concepts of time um, are, or temporality, are, they're just familiar, they're familiar in the Iraqi context, right, whether they're drawn from Islamic discursive, well, the ones I look at are drawn from Islamic discursive traditions, um, or because they're near or close futures, right, they're futures that might actually be realizable because they have some connection to the present. So this is, this is the main way I'm thinking about this. I actually don't go into sort of the ethical self-formation um, discussion of this, which would be really interesting to do. Um, in terms of the Islamic ethical self-formation. <coughs> Maybe I should a little more of the dissertation again. Um, this is not actually related to your question, but I do want to just say something about this also. Is another thing I draw on um, in this uh, fourth concept of familiar futures, I mean, actually I'm drawing on Iraqi scholars who draw on this, is Ibn Khaldun's idea of historical time and the way in which that got rethought by some um, uh, Iraqi thinkers in this time period, like Ali Al-Wardi is, is the main one I look at. Um, so Ibn Khaldun, as many of you might know, had this idea of historical time in which um, right, a civilization is overthrown by invading uh, nomads, and then it progresses over time and develops, and then it um, uh, starts to decline, right? It, um, uh, you know, um, people get too luxurious, and uh, the gap between rich and poor increases, this is how Wardi describes it, um, and then it declines and eventually meets its demise in the form of a new nomadic invasion. So I think about this in, in a number of ways. One is how interesting it is to think about that in relation to the modern developmental concept. You know, people often say this analogy of the human life cycle um, with a nation's or a civilization's development is a modern thing. But Ibn Khaldun used it, and there are lots of European pre-enlightenment thinkers who use the metaphor of the human life cycle to describe a movement of a society through time. The difference is that Ibn Khaldun's idea was not based on the denial of death, right? It, it, um, it uh, progresses, and then it declines, and then it dies, right? So there's a cyclical conception of history built into this linear um, conception. One of the most interesting things for me about this modern developmental imaginary, childhood, adolescent, adulthood, is it just ends with adulthood, right? <laughs> there's no decline, there's no death, right? And I think it's interesting to think about that in relation to some of this, these static concepts of modernity that I've been talking about. That once you get there, you're there, right? So you're either developing or you're developed. And once you're developed, you're developed. Right? And that's it. So it's a very interesting developmental imaginary. I mean, it's, it's weird. Um, uh, and, but also, El Wardi, I mean, I actually did want to read, we'll just read the last uh, paragraph, um, which I kind of mentioned to you earlier, man, at the time of the introduction, um, if I have a minute, because it is um, El Wardi's, um, what? There is time. Okay. Um, I've noticed I have an aversion to dog-earing my own book, which is really interesting. <laughs> I've dog-eared many of yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I write that, um, this is another example of this fourth uh, register of familiar futures. Um, it's in the writings of the Yaqui sociologist, uh, Ali Wardi. In a series of books written in the early and mid-1950s, Al Wardi proposed a modified version of the Khaldunian narrative of historical time, arguing that much of Islamic history in general, and Iraqi history in particular, can be seen as a repeated struggle between the people of the state and the people of revolution. So instead of between tribal nomads and civilized people, this was his reworking of the Chaldeonian narrative, that history is a constant struggle between the people of the state and the people of revolution. A revolution occurs under slogans of freedom and justice, but as soon as it succeeds, the former people of revolution begin their inevitable decline into corruption and injustice, since power is always corrupting despite people's best intentions, and a new people of revolution emerges. We must always oppose the current state, the Lordy insisted, not because our longings for freedom and justice will ever be realized, but because it is the only way to prevent the state from becoming completely unjust. Engaging with the Chaldunian concept of, of cyclical time, as well as with earlier Islamic concepts of moral decline and revival, that's probably what Aaron's uh, talking about, allowed El Wardi to bypass what Jacques Derrida has described as the tiresome trajectory of every 20th century secular political ideology toward its own version of an end of history, and to warn his Iraqi readers, or his Iraqi readers, four years before the events of 1958, that, quote, success is the grave of revolution. So this was very different from how these political parties were operating after the war. <laughs> um, when all the political parties after the revolution argued the revolution happened, now we have to stop, right? The communists, this is the stage for now, later we'll have our socialist revolution, but no more change for now, right? We're just gonna develop capitalism. Um, the uh, liberal democratic party said, yeah, we want liberal democracy, but not yet, you know, let's do economic development. 
um, you know, it, you know, El Gordi's concept, which he wrote this in 1954, um, might have been more productive in some ways, right? The revolution happens, then you keep opposing the current state, um, because according to Gordi, all states are unjust, and the first thing that happens when the revolutionaries come to power is they start to become corrupt. So you have to keep opposing them. Um, so I think, you know, in some ways, that, you know, we, imagine, we think of often the cyclical imaginaries of time as being um, less progressive or less open to change. But in some of these, and, and Jawad Salim is another example of this in the monument um, Sinan was talking about, are using these earlier Islamic concepts of cyclical time, I think, to give um, historical change like more purchase than it, than it often gets in these linear, um, these linear modernization narratives. And it prevents um, this historical time from opening onto this kind of static uh, future of already being developed. So that's my fourth uh, familiar features register. Last question. 